we were in Palm Springs filming Peter Fisk's chat outside in the sunshine. And I was wearing a leather shirt earlier and frankly was starting to melt. So if you'll excuse me, I'll go topless for the rest of the interview. Oh, so. I think that's a wonderful <laughs> thing. <laughs> I should have brought another shirt to wear, but I didn't plan ahead well enough. So, Peter, when we broke there for a moment, you were talking about um, Coulter and the contest in San Francisco and then the onset of AIDS. Please bring us up to speed on that. What was the... How did the community react to the onset of the plague? I know there was ACT UP. Cleve Jones was very famous. Uh, there was the AIDS Emergency Fund. Uh, there were women uh, very beautifully presented in When We Rise from the women's building who came to the ward at General Hospital and, and just helped. Tell us, uh, give us, give us some idea what caused people to do this. Where were they stepping up? Need. It was it was miraculous, really, uh, and I mentioned that the bike clubs, the men's bike clubs, used to uh, take care of each other. So it was an instance of the whole community uh, taking care of the needy. Uh, and if you even even people who were not well were were doing work, uh, uh, and uh, so and everyone was doing something everyone, whether it was uh, women giving blood uh, and, and taking care of men, whether it was uh, uh, leather clubs and, and uh, the AIDS Emergency Fund uh, raising money, uh, whether it was Godfather Service and Alan Selby who took himself off to General Hospital three days a week and spent the day at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at Ward 7B. Uh, giving massages, uh, and somehow Alan could do it. Uh, I went twice and I just couldn't. But everyone pitched in, absolutely everyone. And it was so miraculous because there was no government funding, there was no city funding, there was no nothing. And people were dying. Uh, and I don't mean a few people. In the first uh, five years, of the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco, the death toll was 10,000. In the first 15, year, uh, first 15 years, uh, it was 30,000. Well, the gay population of San Francisco, at its biggest, may have been close to 100,000. So in 15 years, 30% were dead. It was like a war. And everyone had to, had to do what they could. And uh, it became known as the San Francisco model of care, this holistic approach to, uh, uh, there was Shanti to help people prepare to die. Uh, there was grieving groups. Uh, there were uh, 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 organizations like uh, Open Hand uh, that fed people. Uh, uh, Ruth just started to feed people. And, and, and that became, you know, uh, uh, an organization still going today for everyone who's uh, low income or, or ill. Uh, and then uh, there were Rita Rocket's brunches. Rita, who's just, she's still around and she's just a sweet lady. And she went with Alan Selby once to the ward and she thought, I think I'm gonna come and make brunch every Sunday and we'll have a little bit of entertainment and break up the week and give them something to look forward to. And she did those brunches for 15 years. What we did in San Francisco was unique, but in other places, the same sort of thing was happening. In, in New York, there was gay men's health crisis. In Chicago, what's the name of the, uh, the big charity? Uh, Harold Brown, is it? Howard Brown. Howard Brown. Uh, they were doing similar work. In London, there were similar uh, work going on. And, and, and people confronted with this enormous crisis, the worst crisis of, of your life, <coughs> you either go under or you find a way to uh, do what you can. And I'm so impressed that uh, in this moment of crisis, we didn't go under. And I think much of what we are today is a result of what we did then 
in the worst crisis. And if you can survive the worst crisis that's ever happened to you in, or could happen to you, it makes you a little hard, but it also makes you incredibly strong. Tell, take us back to the initial onset of AIDS in San Francisco. How did you become aware of it? A uh, very good friend no, named Tony Tavarosi. And Tony is very well known because he was the manager of the, uh, of the toolbox. And before that, he was the owner of a bar called the Why Not, which was the first leather bar in San Francisco and opened in 1959 about the same time Chuck o opened his bar. <clears throat> and uh, Tony, uh, I remember in the summer of 81, uh, suddenly I saw Tony and he had these dark spots all over him. And he had what was called gay cancer, or carposis sarcoma. And he died within four or five weeks. Incredible. And it was very unpleasant. and. Uh, interestingly enough, in those early years when there was no treatment and we didn't know how AIDS was transmitted, if somebody got a diagnosis, you know, once they had the test, which didn't take too long, uh, if they got a diagnosis, uh, one of our chairmen of the 15, uh, a, a man of color, uh, Charles Durham, uh, took a taxi to the Golden Gate Bridge and jumped off the day he got his diagnosis. And I know others from the, I know, three others from the 15 who uh, off themselves the day they got their diagnosis. Oh, unbelievable. And uh, uh, so uh, there was this enormous fear, but instead of going inward, uh, people reached out and helped each other. And that was miraculous. And that is something I can never forget. And there were so many heroes that there's no way to even to remember all of them. Uh, but everyone, did, did such a great work that we took care of our own, we did what we could, uh, and we all grew up, I think, because we faced uh, this horrible uh, situation. And But we had fun. I mean, the 80s to me, in the middle of the AIDS epidemic, in the middle of people dying, were some of the best times I've ever had. You know, that's when I first started to go to Inferno uh, and, and joined Hellfire. Uh, that's when uh, I met Coulter, and then when Charlie died uh, he, and he moved to San Francisco, we became close. Those are the happiest times of, of my life, and everybody has happy times, but those were mine. And it was the middle of the epidemic. But Coulter passed in 1992. Yeah. Tell us about that. Uh, he, well, I only found out some of the news about that recently, and I don't think he would mind my telling some of it, but I won't tell all of it. Uh, he uh, uh, had been in really good shape, and we went to IML in 1991. And he went on his cruise, uh, uh, the gay cruise, in January of 92. And then he started to go downhill. And uh, the uh, riot uh, uh, in San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, 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 where the man was beaten up by the L.A. Oh, Rodney King? Rodney King, the Rodney King riots. I was trying to go get uh, morphine for <clears throat> Coulter, who was in great pain. And I went to the drugstore, and because uh, the man who was closing up the store knew me and knew Coulter, he said, okay, come on in, and I'll take care of you. And I was the last person. And they, they had already boarded up the windows on Powell Street. And so th that spring, he didn't go to IML, but he didn't want people to know because people could be very hurtful. So he just pretended he'd gone to IML. <laughs> and uh, then he was sick and uh, very briefly in the hospital about four days <coughs> and at home convalescing. And they had put him on, he had to take food through uh, liquid oh, IV. Yeah. And that would take up eight or nine hours. Uh, he did it at night. And he hated doing that. And uh, uh, I remember one time he went to the gym and uh, he hadn't been in a few weeks and, uh, and, uh, and somebody he knew came up to him and said, oh, I heard you died. And not even nicely, you know. 
and, and the guy came home crying. Uh, and it was just the way people were. Some people, they have different ways of dealing with things. But uh, anyway, uh, he, uh, he wanted to have control of the end of his life, and he did have control. Uh, he decided he didn't want any deathbed uh, 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 scenes. And he picked who he wanted to be with him, and that was Shadow Morton. He and Shadow were very, very close. Uh, he, uh, they were intimate. They had uh, a, a sexual relationship. And I think Shadow Morton is probably, Shadow hadn't fully transitioned. So Shadow's the only, the only girl that Coulter was ever with. <laughs> and, wow. and Shadow then fully transitioned and <coughs> is, is uh, a very fine tattooist in San Francisco and we're in touch. And Coulter loved Shadow, loved Shadow whether, whether it was Shadow she or Shadow he. And uh, Shadow made a wonderful transition. Uh, but Coulter uh, decided uh, he couldn't eat and his quality of life had deteriorated. His parents came out for a visit and he moved next door to me then because he wanted his own place. He didn't want his parents to see the wig collection yeah. and the artwork and he didn't want to make me take it down. So. So he moved, and that was two months before he died. And uh, uh, he decided over Labor Day weekend, uh, he tried to have some food on Friday night, some real food. And he spent the whole uh, next day and night sick. And I think he decided then. And uh, he called up Shadow and said, I need you to come over. This was. Uh, Labor Day about eight in the morning, and uh, because this, it, it's now, and so Shadow went over and uh, found Coulter in a bottle of empty pills, and uh, he had a very easy uh, passing. He just uh, got tired and went to sleep. And so many people died in in '92. <coughs> it was right before the cocktail came about. And just about anyone who made it to the end of 1992 or early 1993 is still alive today. Uh, that cocktail was uh, a lifesaver and continues to be. So people are living with AIDS now, not dying from AIDS, although people still do die. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's when I think we've come into the more modern era, this post-AIDS era, uh, certainly uh, since the late 90s. Uh, we have a different time now. Uh, our normal institutions like bike clubs and uh, uh, bars are changing rapidly. Uh, and some will survive and a lot won't. And many clubs in cities have gone under and new ones have come about. Uh, there's been this broad acceptance uh, uh, has taken hold uh, of, of trans uh, men and women, of uh, people of color, uh, of, uh, of women and women's issues. Uh, and I think that's been a really good thing for the community, but it's been a learning process. And pre-AIDS, it just didn't happen. Uh, I'll flash back to, uh, to the 60s when I arrived in San Francisco uh, the bars all had country western music, uh, and I hated country western music. Uh, I did not like Johnny Cash, and if I heard a boy named Sue one more time, I was going to smash the jukebox. <laughs> 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 and there was a certain racist atmosphere in San Francisco in the 60s, uh, and even through uh, uh, the uh, 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 there was one bar for black men in the Castro and, and men who liked black men. And there was a certain spirit of not welcome in the other bars. Wow. They would ask the people of color for their IDs or two IDs, and they wouldn't ask the white people. And thankfully, we didn't see that in the 15. I never saw that in the Hellfire either, uh, 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 that prejudice. Uh, but it certainly was there around the edges. Uh, and. And I, I, as a person of privilege, uh, I certainly could observe when people were discriminated against or treated poorly. 
and, and it bothers me. I don't like it. And I think that's, uh, it, it's not something I can let go either. Uh, and we'll talk about that tomorrow when we, when we talk about the sh shift change towards transgender uh, uh, men. Uh, but, you know, that's something I'm willing to fight for. I, I will not uh, allow people around me to make racist or sexist or, uh, or, or transphobic or, or nasty comments. I will say something. Wonderful. You, you alluded earlier to attending Inferno for the first time. Tell us about that. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, it was Inferno 13. And for the first time, they had uh, three sites, and they had buses that went back and forth between them, uh, 24 hours a day. And uh, it was a very wild event, uh, wilder than Inferno has been in recently, although I think it's getting a second win with the return of sex. But sex everywhere. Uh, they had an area called Maison Merde for, for uh, for scat, uh, they had a piss. They had a they had a piss avenue, you know. Uh, they uh, had big tents uh, for uh, bondage and, and, and whipping and, and uh, needle play, uh, torture, uh, you name it. Uh, some of the things went a little, uh, you know, had to be pushed back. <coughs> Uh, there was one guy who uh, decided he wanted to do a, uh, a, a hanging and had to be told, no, you can't do that here. Wow. If it goes wrong, yeah. even with people standing by, we're not, we're not having that here. And uh, <coughs> because I was experienced with the 15, uh, I started running dungeons for them. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, the heart of, of, of Inferno, the heart of, say, Delta or the 15, is the play. Yeah. It's Twisted Summer Camp. And uh, uh, keeping those dungeons safe, you know, I, and I helped set up the uh, trainings for, for dungeon monitors uh, so that, you know, they would know what to do in an emergency. I always would say to everybody, do you know where the, where the uh, what do you do if the lights go out? Uh, do you know how to get them back on? Uh, do you know where flashlights are? Do you know how to evacuate people here if there's a fire? Uh, what are you going to do if the cops come? And they would just get a signal and everything would have to shut down and you go back to your cabin. And cops did come to, uh, to Inferno uh, many times while I was there. In fact, one time uh, a guy died and the ambulance had to come to take him away. It wasn't during play. But uh, everything had to stop while the cops were on site. And the openness of having this twisted summer camp, which we'd never had in our youth, uh, it was such a joy. Uh, uh, and Hellfire set the, set, the, set the pattern of twisted summer camp. Uh, everybody helped out. Uh, everybody was part of it. Uh, everybody was welcome. Uh, and uh, and everybody tried to get along. And uh, I, I, clubs like the 15 and uh, Seattle Men in Leather and, and Delta have continued that, uh, that sense of belonging, that sense of brotherhood. Uh, and I hope that women's events will get going so that there can be a sense of sisterhood, you know? And uh, uh, I think that's very important. We'll see what happens. Uh, I think it's a good time. It's probably time. Well, we've got Desire out here in Palm Springs. Olga and Blue do amazing things with that. Um, and, of course, there's there's Imsel and, and uh, the, the work that Pat and Sharon are doing yeah. in making that queer inclusive is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're doing great things to further those. The, the women's community. Because the richness of having something like Inferno, something like Delta, something like Seattle Men and Leather, something like the 15, or Avatar, or, or all these other groups, GMSMA, 
uh, the richness of having that community and having a place to meet people that's safe, having a place to play. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to say that we're not losing that to uh, online, to recon or, or, or online. People still want to meet each other. They still want to go be at an event together. They still want to join a club together. Uh, and I guess they still want to go to bars, but maybe not quite as much. But uh, that time in the, in the early 80s, that in the middle of the epidemic that uh, things like Inferno were happening, or things like in San Francisco, this, this amazing uh, uh, renaissance uh, of, uh, of, uh, of caring. And, uh, you know, I got to meet a whole bunch of, uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, transgender, uh, soon to be men who were transitioning. And, uh, and they were re reasonably completely accepted in San Francisco. It just was a magical place. You're, you're a founding member of Delta. Tell us about that. Uh, well, the, uh, Delta has everyone who joined in that first uh, push is a founding member, but I wasn't one of the ones who organized Delta. Oh, I see. Uh, that was uh, a, a group that included a couple of guys from the 15 and included Harold Cox and Charlie Clark and, and some others, uh, Jim Bruce. And uh, uh, Delta was created to be the un-inferno, to be relaxed, uh, to be uh, no sponsorships, no, uh, no soliciting for uh, money, uh, and no club, just an event. Cool and to keep as inexpensive and as accessible as possible. Uh, and I think it's worked very well. Uh, Delta's a very successful and, and a viable and, and vital, uh, relevant organization in the community uh, because of it. And the membership is, is very diverse. But you know, Hellfire's membership is pretty diverse these days too. And, uh, and the 15. So uh, all these men's groups, uh, play groups, are doing well. And uh, many of our community institutions, like, I wish we had more publications, you know. Drummer is sorely missed. Yeah, I believe that. Uh, um, and and uh, what was the Bondage magazine? Bound and Gagged. Bound and Gagged is sorely missed. We used to yes. love Bound and Gagged. Yes. And we just don't have that anymore. Uh, uh, we've got a we've got uh, a couple of magazines that are good in their way, but they're not. Uh, I'd like to see us have real uh, a real renaissance in publishing. And, and <coughs> anyway, <laughs> so uh, we're in the late '80s, early '90s, and uh, the epidemic is changing. It's it's pretty much over, and so. The, uh, the clubs and people start to put things together, uh, but there's this, still this fear of sex uh, that's only now passing because of prep and the cocktail. And it's wonderful to see sex positive uh, uh, behaviors be acceptable and encouraged now. Uh, and so, you know, they started talking about Old Guard in the 80s. I mean, nobody ever heard of Old Guard before then. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like to say that I'm sort of every man in leather. I mean, I've, I've not, not been a prominent person, but I've been around a long time in the middle of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've never founded a club. Uh, I've never, I won some awards and I was Leather Daddy of San Francisco. Uh, and part of the AIDS Emergency Fund and president, uh, and I worked on the Pride Board, so I, I have worked, but I never could say that I'm particularly prominent. Uh, but over the course of 50 years in the community, I have learned a few things, and I'm happy to bring it, bring it out and share it with people so that they can know and uh, uh, have some insight. Uh, and 
I've had a chance to help out people. Uh, not, it's not like I have a class in, or mentor with a rule book or a guidebook. But I like to think, uh, just this week, my friend Eric Crow, uh, who competed at, at IML a few years back, uh, uh, Eric sent me a, a writings he's done and said, you, you encouraged me to write and you encouraged me to be part of the community. And my way of giving back is to send you this so that you can know what you've done. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of our community. It's full of heroes. It's full of people who've gone extra miles. It's full of people who've worked uh, even against their own interests, uh, but for the community. Uh, so for every, for every uh, crazy person or jerk that we have, I think we have 10 or 20 people who are real heroes who probably will never even be known. What's your philosophy on community service? Well, it is not self-serving. You, if you're going to be part of serving your community, it has to be unselfish. It has to be selfless. You are doing it for the community, not for yourself. And if you're involved with an organization, it's what's best for that organization. And sometimes you even have to go against what the current management might be thinking. Okay. Uh, and uh, it takes real dedication. I think I've had burnout. Uh, you do face burnout eventually at some point. Uh, and then I tell people you pull back to where you're comfortable. Uh, if that's doing nothing, if that's just doing a little. Uh, and you find people to take up the work. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes leaders make in a community is they try to do it all themselves and they never train anyone. Right. right. And that's a big mistake. Uh, whatever I've done, whether it's running dungeons at, at Inferno uh, and Delta, or being on the Delta board, or being on the Pride board, or, or the AIDS Emergency Fund board, uh, or being president, is involving new people. Mo moving on a little bit to more more germane issues of today how can our community confront the needs and or the complications or the nuances of aging in the leather well, well, the gay leather community the hetero there leather are community? big issues but i i would call it a duality of issues it's 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 a two-way street uh it's uh it's not just how we treat aging and, and our aging people it's how we treat our youth also. And I think it goes two ways. Uh, uh, young people, they don't want to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. They want to be welcomed with however they want to conduct themselves, just like we did when we were young. And older people want to be accepted for themselves and not just some uh, <laughs> aging and unattractive uh, 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 queen that some of these young folks think they are. And we have to fight that. Uh, and the way to do it is to listen to each other, uh, communicate with each other, and try to have our events uh, diverse. So for instance, we've kind of kept track of ages at Delta. And the age had, the average age had crept up into the almost 50 range uh, some years back, about 10 years back. And gradually, we've brought that down by at least seven or eight years. It's now perhaps low 40s. So there's a range of ages there. Uh, there, are, there are guys in their 20s and even early 20s who go to Delta. Uh, and there are guys in their mid 80s and every, everyone in between. And the same thing has taken place at, at, at other events, at, at, at Hellfire, at Inferno, uh, at the 15. Uh, average ages have started to go down uh, and we get it in the organizations I think if you want to have a viable organization you have to have a range of ages mm -hmm. and interests mm -hmm. and in particular if you if you uh, if you're not welcoming and if you don't let people participate and have power they will walk every time uh, it was GMSMA was a classic case they uh, uh, 
decided they needed to appeal to young uh, men. And so they offered a junior membership for $10 a year, where full membership was about 50 Oh, I see. And they had special events. But they had no power in the organization. And eventually they all walked and they didn't know how to cope, so they didn't do anything to attract anyone. And kind of like the bike clubs, they were not very friendly if you showed up there. And they were doing the same programs by the same people year after year, decade after decade, well, not quite, but uh, to the point where no one would work anymore and they went under. And that's what happened to most of the bike clubs. And I've, I've seen it. Uh, San Francisco, the uh, AIDS charities these days, have been combining because they can't afford to uh, have all the employees when money is, is going, money available has to go to uh, treatment and to uh, patient services, yeah. not to salaries. <coughs> so uh, uh, I, I think there's a great respect for elders in the community. But I want to see beyond that respect. I want people to look at me as another human being. Uh, and they don't have to play with me unless they're interested. But I don't want to feel like I'm unwelcome. And I certainly don't want young people to feel they're unwelcome. And I think unconsciously it sometimes happens. Yeah, yeah. You've alluded earlier to the concept of old guard new guard. What are your thoughts on these things? Well, uh, first off, old guard never existed. Uh, there's no council of elders. It's become, a, it's become a fun joke. It really has. They couldn't even figure out which, where to wear your, your, uh, uh, your chain uh. on your boot or your leather jacket. On the East Coast in the 60s, you, you wore, if you were top, you wore your chain on your leather jacket and chain on your boot on the right. And in California, the opposite, on the left. Uh. And so there was, a, there was this wide divergence between communities and histories. Uh, so there was no one old guard, period. And uh, there were, Guy Baldwin and, and, and Gail Rubin have spoken about families often veterans of World War II who had uh, uh, people in their orbit, uh, their boy, their friends, uh, enough to fill a dinner table, you know, on weekends. And, uh, and that's how you learned, and that's how you earned your leather, and that's this concept of earning your leather. That was around to a certain extent. Uh, but no, there was no such thing as protocols. Nobody even uh, heard that uh, word until the 80s. Uh, and I'm not putting them down because if that's what you're into, go for it. Mm. Uh, and there are many people I know who have wonderful times with uh, uh, DS relationships or, or MS relationships. Uh, and so uh, if that's what you want, go for it. But don't tell me that, that there was uh, uh, this old guard and this council of elders and, and all this when there wasn't. Yeah. Different. Different families uh, did things different ways. Uh, I knew Guy and I knew um, uh, several different families uh, in the leather scene in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s. And they did have their own ways of doing things, but it went, didn't go beyond those families. And actually, I think of myself, uh, I, I wouldn't want to be boxed into old guard or new guard. Uh, you know, I'm sort of the no guard. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Uh, I really don't believe in the concept. It made a nice uh, 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 speech, uh, 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 and it, it, it's an interesting topic. Uh, I think the real topic is how do you uh, get people to interact with each other and uh, uh, build a sense of community. And Creating old guard and new guard perhaps helped with that, but I think the time for it is over now. We've moved on. I think it's beyond that now. So what advice do you have for people new to this community? Uh, get in and get to know people. 
uh, get friends. Uh, if you want to get something done, remember the advice uh, of Harvey Milk. Uh, get allies. Be nice about it. Uh, but be firm. And know very clearly what you want to do. Uh, and there's room for everyone in this community. Uh, there's still prejudices of all sorts. Income is one of them. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have money in the leather community, you're kind of, it's difficult. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, get involved. There's a real nice community here, and you can be part of it. Beautiful.